close to one o'clock. So I call the uh, meeting of the House Veterans and Military Affairs Committee to order. Uh, and would you all please stand as we uh, pledge allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all. Let's see. Representative or Lead Bliss, would you like to uh, move the minutes for the uh, last meeting? So moved, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Representative Bliss has moved the minutes for the meeting of uh, the 23rd of January. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Good. The minutes are approved. Uh, today we're going to change the order a little bit from what we have on the schedule because the uh, uh, Department of uh, Military Affairs has another meeting. So if we could ask, uh, or Veterans Affairs, excuse me. Is that is that correct? Okay. Uh, ben, uh, you're coming up with, uh, is Commissioner Herkey here as well? Okay, please, please come forward. Good afternoon, Commissioner. If you would uh, identify yourself for the record and proceed with the uh, presentation. Good afternoon, Chair Newton, committee members, and for the record, I am Larry Herkey. I'm the Commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs. I want to thank you for this opportunity to present the Governor's recommended biennial budget for MDBA for fiscal years 24 and 25. With me today, I have Ben Johnson to my right, your left and the MDBA's uh, legislative director, and I also have many other subject matter experts here in, in the uh, audience with me today. Today I'm prepared to brief an overview of the governor's request, change items to the MDBA-based budget. My briefing will provide operational budget adjustments, two new program areas, uh, needed funds to achieve fund zero for veterans homelessness and operational funding to begin and operate the three new homes that are currently under construction and the one new cemetery uh, in Minnesota. I'll begin with an overview of MDVA's base budget for fiscal year 24 and 25. The Minnesota Department of Vet Veterans Affairs, as you know, because I briefed you last time I was here, has the Veterans Programs and Services and Veterans Health Care as the two major divisions. The purpose of the base budget overview for each of these divisions is further, is further broken down. Within the Programs and Services, you'll see base operating budget or role for veterans cemeteries, operations, veterans homelessness program, and base funding for um, nonprofit grants. Total fiscal year 24 and 25 base funding is currently at 48 million. Under the area of Veterans Health Care and Veterans Homes Division, we have an operating budget for our existing home operations, a row to cover the three new veterans homes currently under construction and scheduled to open this summer of 2023, and finally a row reflecting the Veterans Suicide Prevention Office. The base for veterans health care for fiscal years 24 and 25 is 140.2 million, million, and the total for the agency is a total of 188.6 million. And uh, just a comment there is uh, under veterans health care, the amount provided uh, for the biennium was 15 million for the new homes. That was just a placeholder and nowhere reflected the actual needs for the operations, it was just a placeholder based on the last budget um, projection. Next, uh, Governor's recommendations. It, um, our staff has been hard at work with the state stakeholders from Veteran Service Organization, our partners, 
in the, pro in the nonprofit sector and other agencies such as Minnesota Housing, Minnesota Management Budget, and of course the Governor's Office. With the Governor's support, we've developed a package of initiatives to help assist Minnesota veterans and their families. And I have a total of 13 change items and I'll present those in priority order. The first item is to establish the three new veterans home. This is not operational funding required. Our first priority is to secure $20 million in operational funding for the three new state veterans homes currently under construction. That'd be $5.5 million in fiscal year 2024 and $14.5 million in fiscal year 2025. Back in 2018, the state appropriated $32 million to cover 35% of the building costs for these three new homes. Additional approval was also granted at that time for me to seek addition, the federal funding to cover the other 65% from the VA Homes Program. We received that federal funding in 2021 and construction began. And as I briefed last time, we're between 70% and 80% complete with the homes today. That year, we also uh, received a base appropriation of $7.5 million for each year in FY24-25. This additional operating request will ensure the necessary resources are available for the initial operations and startup costs for the first year of operation get certification obtained from the federal VA and staffing and resident numbers increase. So we're gonna go in this case from zero residents and our intent during the first year is to try to get as close as we can to 70% capacity and during the second year go from 70% to our ultimate goal which is to maintain a 95% or greater capacity as far as our census. And just as a reminder, this will add 198 additional beds in Greater Minnesota in the cities of Preston, Bemidji, and Montevideo. Um, the mo model we'll use after that, or as we, as we do this transition in the second year, is to align with the operation of our other existing homes. And this model is a combination of state general funding appropriation, VA per diem, veterans maintenance fees, and Medicare and third party reimbursements. All right, second one is to maintain current service levels and our current throughout the rest of the agency. Our next priority is maintain those current agency wide service levels. A general fund increase of 14.7 million in 2024 and 18.5 million in fiscal year 2025. Each year, of course, the cost to provide benefit services to Minnesota veterans and their family increases. Even when we worked hard to identify ways to improve efficiencies and the main productivity within our existing budget, the cost of doing business has outpaced our ability to, um, to to find enough savings. For MDVA, the operating costs pressures exist in multiple categories. For example, compensation for compensation and insurance costs within the agency for staffing, increasing costs to maintain our current staffing, complement in a changing labor market, and of course, increasing IT costs. And for the first time, just so you know, we've actually had to pay um, we've had to pay um, recruiting and retention incentives in order to get talent and to keep talent. So this is something new for us that we haven't had to do in the past. In addition, over the past three years, COVID-19 has taken a significant impact on our fiscal year 2022 and 2023 budgets, but facing a healthcare Staffing shortage because of COVID, we had a huge amount of people that retired at the beginning of our time period and we've had a lot of turnover during COVID-19. People have just left the industry and went 
other places for employment. Uh, currently, today, our staffing level will support about a 75% of our um, of our capacity. So we're down about 20% from where we were pre-COVID as it relates to the census within our homes. Um, a reduced census results in fewer bed days of care and reduced federal VA per diem reimbursements. At the same time, salary and compensation related increase have driven up agency operating costs. The operating costs also increased due to higher than normal inflation in the past year, or actually the last two years. As an example, our food, food, fuel, and utilities have increased on average by about 15%, and supply costs have increased by about 12%. The agency has had to use all available funds to continue to operate the five current homes safely and effectively and support our programs and services operations throughout the agency. That is priority two. Priority three, our third priority is the first four entries from MDVA and the Waltz Flanagan Administration Historic Budget budget package on housing stability. And for those of you who don't know what SOAR means, which I always have to look it up myself, it's SSDI, SSI, Outreach and Access and Re Recovery is what I have here. Um, it's a program that focuses on Social Security and getting Social Security to those who are eligible. Uh, the governor and lieutenant governor interagency budget for housing stability represents the biggest investment in housing and homelessness in the state's history. At over $1.5 the entire package addresses the continuum of housing needs and preventing and ending homelessness to create healthy rental market for low-income renters to close the disparities in home ownership. Minnesota is committed to becoming the fourth state in the nation to declare an end to veterans homelessness statewide. Uh, my agency's uh, contribution to this historic package being, begins with $2.8 million dedicated for homeless veterans and veteran SOAR pro teams in the MDVA. And just as a note, this program was recognized by the legislature in 2022 but provided no funding at that time. So um, we do run the Homeless Veteran, veteran um, Registry. It's a tool that identifies veterans experiencing homelessness and connects them to the services in a timely and efficient manner. And the SOAR team provides advocacy services to veterans and their dependents in danger of homelessness or experiencing homelessness. The homeless veteran and SOAR teams have not previously been funded through a permanent appropriation and have instead been funded out of the State Soldiers Assistance Fund, or SSAP. Uh, we recommend the $1.4 million to cover the 12.7 FTEs that are currently in these two programs, and we would return the $1.4 million per year in gap funding to the to the SSAP for use in direct financial assistance to veterans, their dependents in areas such as dental, optical care, housing payment assistance, home repairs, vehicle repairs, and helping to resolve short-term financial crises. <coughs> Priority number four. <coughs> State Veterans Cemetery, this is a funding adjustment. The governor recommends an additional $1.78 million in fiscal year 24 and again in each year after that from the general fund to maintain the current level of service delivery at the Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs State Veterans Cemeteries. Our first cemetery uh, opened in 1994 with, uh, at uh, Little Falls near Camp Ripley. And between its opening and the end of fiscal year 2022, we've interned 9,266 veterans in that cemetery alone. And if you add the other 
two cemeteries that are currently operating in Duluth and in Preston, we've had over 10,000 interments, uh, which we happened just a few months ago. We had our 10,000th uh, interment overall. In addition to general fund appropriations, state veteran cemeteries do generate revenue annually on a per burial basis in the form of plot allowances from the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs or eligible dependent burial fees. Revenues collected from these two sources are deposited in what's called a cemetery maintenance development account and it supplements the department's general fund appropriation. The practice of supplementing operational costs through the utilization of the CMD account, which is the largest, of course, was with Little Falls Cemetery, of course has been effective, but it's been drawn that account down significantly as we've uh, had to bring on additional people to keep up with the number of interments that we're doing. Uh, this model is not sustainable and the cost of the revenues and the newer facilities are factored in. And the operational costs are 57% higher than our appropriation. And the CMD is on, pay, on pace to be exhausted about halfway through fiscal year 24. We recommend this funding increase in order to bring the base funding up the required levels to support salary and operational costs. So the intent here would be to use a general fund to take care of salaries and let the CMD account take care of equipment and fixtures and, and minor repairs and so forth that are needed throughout the, throughout the facilities. Priority number five. MACB supportive housing grant. I mentioned this a little bit about my previous testimony and how well this had, this had gone over the last year. The Minnesota legislature passed the Veterans Omnibus Bill, which included partial funding, again, partial funding for permanent supportive housing for homeless veterans throughout Minnesota. We partnered in this case with the Minnesota Assistance Council, our MACV, and through our partnering, we were actually able, to, we gave them enough money to uh, acquire 30 units and we encouraged them to find private money to do matches with the public money. They were pretty successful in that. They were able to find private money in order to get us to 53 total units. And uh, we're finding that there are a lot of people out there that are willing to help, but. Uh, they sort of like to join the movement as it's moving along. So um, I'm proud to say that we put that in their grant. They took us up on it and they went out and found that private funding. We know that we knew that 53 units was not going to be enough. So today's request for 7.15 million in fiscal year 2024 would be enough money for 55 additional permanent supportive housing units. We, we believe that with this funding, if we ask them to match again with private funding, that we could get upwards of a, my goal for them will be 80 units. Um, and I think again, they have enough people that are ready to contribute and they've seen the success of the previous um, housing that we've acquired. I believe there's enough support out there to do that. The governor also recommends funding for $750,000 in fiscal year 2024 and 750,000 in subsequent years to provide property management for the residential services for the total of all the permanent supporting housing units. This program, which we call V-Show, is creating truly affordable permanent housing for veterans facing extremely high barriers to housing that the private market is not producing. So this is, this is one program that's showing results. It's driving down the number of days. It's driving down the number of people that are chronic homelessness and we're getting at the people that have been on the Veterans Registry the longest, which was the intent of, the, of this program. <clears throat> Priority number six. There be no general fund increase with this item. We're asking for authority for invest um, 
to roll over from the last biennium to the current biennium. In 2021, MDVA and the state of Minnesota funded the housing voucher and wraparound services called the Minnesota Veterans Entering Stable Tenancy, or MVEST. Um, this program, again, has been another one of the keys to our success. The requirements for us is not only to fund those that are true veterans as it relates to the federal, federal requirements, but also those that are previous uh, service members who have served our country and uh, are not covered by HUD bash vouchers or other federal voucher programs. This invest program provided 150 housing subsist substances, subsidies for veterans experiencing homelessness or in danger of experiencing homelessness but are not eligible for federal HUD bash housing subsidies, I can't say that word today. For the enrolled participants, the program also provides intensive case management, which is key to success in rental assistance throughout Minnesota. So this is not only the rental assistance, but this is the wraparound services, and that's the key to actually keeping these veterans in the homes and keeping them successful. Uh, we did do an RFP for this process. MACV did end up getting it through a competitive process, but it took a long time to get this contract in place. These contracting delays resulted in delays for MACB for hiring staff and slowed the initiation of the enrolling of veterans and provision of services for those programs. So it just took a lot longer than we thought to get it off the, to get going, but it is actually working very well right now and it's a critical factor to achieving functional zero for the state of Minnesota. Creating a rollover provision for the remaining appropriation in the fiscal years 24 and 25 will ensure MACB can administer all funds allocated to the permanent housing vouchers and assist and associated supportive services. And just so you know, I make them do a line chart, a flow chart, so I know every day how many of these vouchers we need and right now we're on track. If I'm able to get this role of authority, we'll be able to continue to move those that have no other way of, no other way for me to help them with rental vouchers or, or the wraparound services. So it's doing well. It just took longer than I anticipated to get it off and running. Priority number seven. This is expanding services. This is really getting upstream and as it relates to the area of veterans homelessness. Um, this direct veteran assistance is, um, provides a, a direct a veterans assistance line. We want to increase that from 370 to 900,000 per fiscal year in the FY 24 and 25. And MACB uses and these legislatively funded grants to provide comprehensive programs of services, housing sort and housing support, and financial assistance tailored to help every veteran and their family obtain, obtain or maintain stable permanent housing. MACV has continued to see an increase in veteran pre prevention requests, specifically noting a 94% increase in rental assistance a 200% increase in mortgage assistance and a 40% increase in utility assistance during the first quarter of fiscal year 2023. This is keeping those veterans in their home so that they don't become part of the veterans homelessness issue, but therefore we don't track, have to track them and find other accommodations for these for these veterans. It's been very successful and it really probably will be the more of the focus going forward. Without an increase in these funds, MACB will be limited in their long-term ability to continue to provide homelessness prevention resources to veterans in the community. That priority number eight. This is a new program and one, one that I mentioned a little bit during my last testimony. 658,000 in fiscal year 2024 and 633 in fiscal year 2025 for the establishment of Veterans Community Health Program. 
So our health program we have currently today is focused exclusively on our veterans' homes. I believe we need to do more for our veterans. Our first movement in that direction was really the suicide prevention program. That's a community health issue. And that really is focused on all the rest of the veterans outside of the homes and so forth. The ones inside the homes have plenty of people helping provide care and, and, and assistance. Um, this new uh, community health program is for those Minnesota veterans who do not receive care from the U.S. Department of, Department of Veterans Affairs. And there's a knowledge gap in, in between community health care workers and the understanding of veterans' needs and veterans' benefits. This, prevents, this presents a challenge to connect veterans, service members, and their families with their earned benefits. And as we know that uh, veterans die of suicide in Minnesota, only, only three of 10 veterans are connected to VA healthcare. And we believe that the total amount uh, for all veterans in Minnesota is less than 40% are actually tied to the VA healthcare system. <clears throat> These veterans are receiving community-based care in our hospitals and our health systems and establishing a state veterans community navigator program staffed by social workers with veteran status or veterans related experience and embedded in a non-VA healthcare system throughout the state can bridge this gap. This is actually going on today. These navigators are in the region there are 2.5 FTEs in Regions Hospital that are doing this today, and they're helping between 30 and 50 veterans just in that hospital each day. In some cases, they're pushing them back towards the federal VA healthcare system. In other cases, they're actually providing, as the word navigator says, they're providing them to either community-based assistance or other assistance provided by my agency to help and assist those veterans that are in need. The role will be to promote connectedness to earn benefits and resources that will impact overall mental wellness and physical health. So that they will be there um, in, so that we envision to begin with three navigators in major health systems and then a director that would be responsible for those navigators, the Veteran Suicide Prevention Program, and also the the um, Hidden Heroes Program are those direct care uh, individuals that are helping veterans within the home. So there'd be three different distinct focus areas for this particular program. Priority number nine, Minnesota Service Corps funding adjustment. The governor recommends 525,000 additional funding each year for the core program, and core stands for casework, outreach, referral, and education. Core brings essential community-based direct services directly to the veterans and families across Minnesota at no cost to them. MDVA partners with the Lutheran Social Services to provide comprehensive assistance through their existing network of resources. For many veterans, dependents of the, the Minnesota Service Corps program program is the only way that they can afford mental health services. And this program is actually used um, more, well, per, per capita it's probably used more in greater Minnesota than it is actually even here in the Twin Cities. From fiscal year um, 13 through fiscal year 2018, the core pro program expenditures have increased by 124,000. And in 2019, the legislature did increase the core program appropriation from 500,000 to 750,000. We continue to help more veterans each year, which I think is a good good thing, but costs for this help and assistance have, have went up. Uh, from fiscal year 2019 through fiscal year 2022, core program expenditures increased by 294,000. Expenditures are uh, projected increase of an additional 350,000 from fiscal year 22 through the end of fiscal year 2025. And to date, um, MDVA has not requested or used any of the LSS 
for appropriation for internal management of the contracted services. We've used other staff to manage this and from other programs. Um, the 150,000 per year is to cover an increased department. Increases the department has incurred since the last appropriation increase in fiscal year 2020. And 85,000 of this increase will be used to partially fund a new position with the MDVA healthcare division. The remaining 290,000 thousand the recommendation will be used to cover project expenditure increases through the end of fiscal year 2022 20, through 24. I've had many people come to me about this program alone and they're very um, they like it because it covers not only the veteran but the veterans family and it's in a lot of these places where they're remote from vet centers or other support that they could potentially use this as something that they can use that's actually in their community and therefore they're using this um, service. Um, it also includes things like financial counseling, family counseling, mental health counseling. There's a large myriad of areas that the core program, program actually covers. Priority area number 10. This is a link vet program, which is an existing program. It's our way to communicate or get in contact. If you want to know more about anything, any veterans program within the state of Minnesota. In 2008, the Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs partnered with Distance Minnesota, an internal work order within M State Network to provide call center operations. And our number is 81888 link vet to Minnesota vets. This uh, service provides support seven days a week during normal business hours and somewhat into the evening. There's a call center. You can use a chat function, an email function, or you can actually use the, the call center itself or a crisis hotline. The initial appropriation for link vet in 2008 was insufficient to fully fund its operation and of course has not been increased since that time. In fiscal year 2011, Link Belt operating costs were 277,000 per year, which was uh, 57,000 more than its appropriation. And the appropriation deficit grew to 201,000 in fiscal year 2022, and it's expected to grow to 280,000 by the end of fiscal year 2025. The, gover the governor recommends increasing the link bed appropriation by 280,000 each year, bringing the total appropriation to 500,000 per year. Uh, this would mm. enable us to return approximately 152,000 per year to our support our troops funds, which we've been using those to continue to keep the link vet line open and available to our veterans. Priority number 11. <coughs> this would be expanding the one, this is a one time expense, expanding the 9-11 bonus. In 2022, MDVA requested 46 million for Minnesota's post 9-11 service bonus to all veterans who served between September 11th, 2001 and August 30th, 2021. The appropriation that we received was 24 million, a little over 24.88 million. In addition, the 2022 session law admitted many current veterans from any bonus or limited bonus amount for veterans could, who would otherwise be eligible for a greater amount. Veterans who currently live in Minnesota but not did not begin their service were here are not eligible to apply for the post 9-11 veterans service bonus. If you ask me, Commissioner, what's that percentage? My best guess is that percentage is between 15 and 25 percent of all veterans and then uh, that are during this era. And that's just based on because many of them go to their website and they try to apply and they just drop off because they can't go any further. But I've had enough emails and complaints that I know that there's still a significant number of these veterans 
that are out there that are currently not eligible. Um, Veterans who currently live in Minnesota but not begin their service are here or not eligible to apply for the post 9-11 veteran service bonus. Otherwise eligible veterans who receive the inherent resolve campaign medal but not one of the other qualifying medals are only eligible for a $600 bonus. Before the creation of the inherent resolve medal, a service member deployed to Iraq, Syria or contiguous waters or airspace would likely be given a Global War and Terrorism Expeditionary Medal and the $1,200 bonus. The governor recommends adding the Inherent Resolve Campaign Medal and amending the eligibility requirements to allow current Minnesota veterans who entered military service in another state but subsequently moved to Minnesota after their service access to the Minnesota Post 9-11 service program. He also recommends an additional $22 million in fiscal year 2024 to ensure that all eligible Minnesota post 9-11 <coughs> veterans have access to the post 9-11 veteran service bonus. And my focus here was to get to 85 percent of the eligible, potential eligible veterans and that's where the $22 million is based on that additional money needed to get us to 85 percent. Priority area 12. This is also a new, basically a new program for us. The governor recommends uh, 402,000 in fiscal year 2024 and 327,000 in each subs subsequent year to operate the recently separated veterans program or RSVP. The Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs operates the RSVP, a, col a collection of related activities centered around capturing the veterans as they're discharged from active duty and connecting them to the benefits and service they're entitled to. Right now our program is pretty meager. It's a letter. I send you a letter, I send you a letter and say congratulations. Here's the website, here's our telephone number, here's LinkVet. And um, there's not, not a lot of other things that go on. We, do, we did receive your DD-214 from DOD. We used to get that in a hard copy, and that's changing too, which I'll talk about here in just a moment. But we want to significantly expand this program to make sure that we're interacting with these newly or recently separated veterans. Currently, there's no dedicated appropriation for these activities and the operating costs are being covered by other program funds. The U.S. Department of Defense and the Defense, Defense Manpower Center have strategic goals to move to strategic <laughs> systems and verifying veteran status and setting, sunsetting the older repository systems that provide image copies of DD-214s. We're leaning forward in MDVA to ensure we can interface with big data systems and better capture information as it relates to the, the Minnesota veteran population. Dedica dedicated funding of this program allow MDVA to engage and communicate with the veteran population on existing benefits and services they're eligible for. It will also offer us the ability to inform, establish, and recently separated veterans about their new benefits and services that they're eligible for, such as the newly expanded VA benefits authorized by the PACT Act. The federal VA is, has a, a program called Solid Start. And my intent is still to get a warm handoff from that program as it relates to recently um, vet, veterans who have been recently discharged. Priority 13, GI Bill funding change. In this case, we're asking for no additional funding. We'd like to see a policy change. The GI Bill indexing the, uh, indexing the eligible veteran lifetime benefit, increasing the fiscal year benefit amount. MDVA receives an annual open appropriation of $6 million to administer the Minnesota GI Bill. The current access to that is $3,000 per fiscal year or $10,000 per lifetime. This fiscal year award has not changed since the program was initiated in 2007. 
However, the cost of attendance in Minnesota as institutions of higher learning has gone up exponentially during the same period. Based on the state college and university data, tuition fees and housing have increased 52% during that time period on, on Minnesota's colleges and 88% on Minnesota's universities. The governor recommends the educational assistance, assistance amounts of the Minnesota GI Bill to allow any eligible student access to $6,000 per fiscal year or $15,000 per lifetime. This recommendation does not increase the amount of the open appropriation and the change reflected would not exhaust that, an that amount annually. And so we have a summary slide here at the end. Um, the last slide is a summary of the items recommended. Let's the change items for 24 and 25. <coughs> Now I have to admit the 90.95.5 million dollars is a lot of money for 24 and 25. But I think you put it into this perspective. 31% uh, of the change, or about 29 million, is due to one-time funding. That's to thank our service members and to expand the veteran housing to house those veterans so that we can get to functional zero. Again, another 31% of that change item, or about 29 million, is due to expanded operations. This increase should have been should have been anticipated to operate our three new homes, our one new cemetery, and two new programs. The last and biggest portion of this is the change item request is due to operational adjustments due to existing home cemeteries and programs. That's a total of about 37.4 million. I think that this budget request reflects a serious commitment to Minnesota's nearly 300,000 veterans and their families. I think it demonstrates a commitment to declaring an end to veterans homelessness, to offering support and service to our veterans throughout the state, no matter where they live. Finally, this budget package will enable Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs to continue to offer the highest levels of care to those veterans who reside in our state veterans homes and those who will, will soon be residents in our newest veterans home. I thank you for your attention. And at this point, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, Commissioner, uh, I, I think, uh, I see uh, Representative Wines has a question, but I, I'd like to limit the questions uh, today because we're gonna be seeing the bills coming forward and you're gonna be presenting the individual bills as we move forward. Uh, and that'll give us an opportunity to really, really dig into things more. But uh, Representative Wines, if you'd like to ask a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Weens, um, to uh, <clears throat> sometimes, I'm, I'm the other, but most of the times I'm not. Uh, Commissioner Herkey, thank you again uh, for bringing your priorities. Um, and I think we'll probably get into some of the stuff as the as the chair mentioned. Um, but I am curious, um, sort of in, in the recent, in the last five, six years, uh, the homelessness uh, issue has arisen and you've stood up to meet it. And I think in your last presentation, you had mentioned uh, you're at about tracking somewhere around 250 homeless vets in Minnesota, in the metro area. Um, is there any estimation you have where we are in this journey to get to that net zero on veteran homelessness? Uh, is it is it is it going to will it peak or are we on the downward side? And then I have one follow up question. Uh, Commissioner. Well, Mr. Chair. Uh Representative Beans, um, I think the answer to your question there, we are seeing a bump up. I think I didn't maybe mention that. We're over 300 now, um, primarily due to the moratorium coming off. And what we found is it's taken a little bit longer for all the legal work to happen behind the scenes. But now the, the people that we have not, veterans that we have not seen previously are coming to us for help. So this is just if we hadn't been ready to stand up, this would have hit us right in the face and we, we could have really went sideways bad. But we're, we're placing people very quickly now 
And uh, to answer your other part of your question, I guess, is that with this, what's in this budget, I, th I, I know that we're within two years. If I get what's within this budget, because I'm, I'm down to two, two places left, and it's Ramsey and Hennepin County. It's the two hardest ones. It's the two that have had the most homeless veterans all the way along. But those numbers are coming down. The numbers of chronic veterans are coming down. The number of days homelessness are coming down. We're moving all the indicators that the United States Internet Interagency Council on Homelessness requires, requires us to do. So I feel that we now know the key to success. I just need this additional funding and that rollover authority in order to get us to where we are. And then my focus after that will be on prevention and keeping veterans from becoming homeless to begin with. Mr. Chair, one follow up, uh, and it won't require you to say subsidy. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm curious just about the success rate or how many veterans that enter your on the homelessness side uh, come come out and re-enter society or reintegrate, and if you track that, um, and I would love to meet uh, some of those folks and hear their story maybe on a testimony at a later time, and that, that concludes my question for the commissioner. Commissioner Hurt. Um, Chair Newton, um, Representative Beans, um, we have had significant number of people who have graduated and moved beyond um, needing the either MVEST or HUD batch vouchers. Um, mostly when we get them into a, a stable job situation, they learn life skills that maybe that no one taught them before and they're able to sort of take care of themselves through that support of services. Great. They go on and follow a job to other locations and would be more than willing to bring one of those individuals to you. Um, but uh, I wouldn't say everyone graduates, but many of them graduate and they're very successful with the rest of their lives. Good, thank you. Um, so we'll, we'll dispense with additional questions right now just to make sure that we are uh, able to take care of the bill that's before us and uh, uh, General Mankey. Uh, so with that, thank you, Commissioner. Ben, thank you for, <laughs> for your presentation. Uh, and uh, we'll be looking forward to seeing the bills as they come through and, and having further discussion. So again, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, members. And uh, Representative Morris, if you'd like to come forward to present um, House File 284. And while he's coming up, I'll move uh, House File 284 be re referred to the House Labor and Industry Finance and Policy Committee. Um, before you begin, Representative Morris, we, we or Norris, we have. Um, two amendments, and uh, Representative Ween says the first one is he here? It just popped up. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah, please. <laughs> I was Re politics. Yeah, Representative Weens, if you would uh, like to present your amendment, please. Yes, sir. Uh, 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 Chairman and uh, Representative Norris, uh, I move uh, the A1 amendment. Uh, this amendment uh, goes to an, in great collaboration with uh, Representative uh, Norris on uh, how we get things through in bipartisanship. And one of the things I know in my vast experience with veterans is they're really a no BS group of people. If something works and we've got a game plan that works and we can sell that, they will buy into it and they will do it. Uh, in order to do that, we have to have, we have to act responsibly, accountably, have transparency, and we need to evaluate it to make certain it works. Uh, my experience, of uh, touring uh, Helmets to Hard Hats and having a discussion with Representative Norris is that's the kind of program we have. And my amendment goes to that point where we're able to get a report back and understand how many successful graduates we have. So uh, I offer this as a friendly amendment and I, I thank you for your time considering. Thank you, Representative Weins. 
Yeah. Representative Norris. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Weens, for offering this amendment. I will accept it as a, a friendly amendment. I share uh, Representative Weens' goal of making sure that we're being good stewards of taxpayer dollars. I'll, I'll just add we don't have any you know, particular concerns about this organization in particular, but we want to just make sure that we're always being uh, good stewards of those taxpayer dollars, and reporting certainly helps in that regard. Okay, so Representative Weens moves the A2 amendment. All in favor of the amendment, please signify by saying aye. 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 Well, I had a question to the amendment, Mr. Uh, yes, Representative, go ahead. For the record, I, I did both for the amendment. Um, <laughs> I guess my, my question is, and I obviously I'm supportive of the amendment, my question is um, just how this compares. I mean, there are other, obviously there are other nonprofits that receive funding from the state government, how this report compares in terms of requirements, cost, effort involved in, and that sort of thing. I, I think obviously um, accountability and transparency, transparency is important. I, I get a little bit, I don't think concerned is the right word, but um, I always sometimes question when we kind of go sort of through, you know, organization by organization and require reports rather than sort of <coughs> working that into sort of the general proposal from the beginning. So I don't know if Representative Weens or if anybody as an answer to that, just how this compares to other sort of requirements for those kinds of organizations. Yeah, I'll pass it off to you. Uh, thank you, Representative Coulter. Representative Weens, do you? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and that's a friendly question. Uh, thank you, uh, Representative Coulter. Um, as, as you know, both of us being freshmen and seeing how things work and being at this particular committee and having the opportunity mm -hmm. to add, uh, I think, a little bit of substance and a little bit of feedback and those kinds of things that weren't previously there but maybe were discussed about, uh, that's where I would lo like to be an advocate for that type of uh, enlightenment. I mean, I'm an Army guy, so after everything we did, we had an AAR, after action review. What do we do right? What do we do wrong? What do we need to improve? What do we uh, need to be aware of and risks and, and those kinds of things? So as I see, and with uh, Representative Liz Lagarde's, uh, we've, we've had a discussion about his. I don't want to be overbearing because there are some systems already there. Dolly has uh, collects some data, but we don't have a requirement for it to come back to us. I want to hear success stories, and whether it's uh, veterans uh, at the Lake Resort or it's the Veterans Restorative Justice, I want to be involved with that to make it dynamic living and rewarding for our veterans so we get a report back. Um, and I think my partner here, uh, Representative Hudella, would like to just add something he's very familiar. Yes, Representative Hudella. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I, I run a military nonprofit that helps military kids and families, and, and the nonprofits receive some very small dollars over the years um, from the state, nor, uh, namely the Minnesota Department of Military Affairs through SOT or the Support Our Troops license plates uh, grants. Um, all of those grants come with some pretty substantial red tape for reporting uh, considerably more than what's offered in the uh, amendment. Um, when we've received those in the past, we have to provide receipts of every dollar spent for that particular project along with P&Ls, and it's um, pretty cumbersome. It's, it's probably why we don't go after more government money, to be honest. Um, but uh, I, I think the amendment offered by uh, Representative Weens is at, at least a, a little bit of insight into trying to get at the success stories. Good. Representative Coulter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And yeah, and again, I mean, to be clear, I obviously have no concern with the amendment. I, I think it, it's maybe just sort of a broader conversation of, I mean, this is, you know, another, what, $27,500, I think, um, for a report that I'm, I'm sure will provide valuable information. I guess maybe what I'm getting at is, um, you know, is, is this something we need to look at more of a, as in, in a broader sort of systemic approach <coughs> rather than going through bill by bill and kind of putting it in? That's, that was my only concern. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I, just to be clear, I would like to, um, again, uh, move the A2 amendment, uh, Representative Wien's amendment, and make sure that everyone understands it. All in favor of the amendment, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, the amendment uh, is moved 
And Representative uh, Norris, you also have an amendment, if you would move that, please. Yes, Mr. Chair, I'd like to move the A3 amendment. The A3 amendment is uh, on the table. And uh, Mr. Chair, this, this actually kind of goes to some of the, the questions that uh, Representative Coulter just raised about uh, additional costs for the organization of, of complying. Uh, this amendment adds an extra $2,500 per year to the appropriation, uh, in particular to help cover the cost of the independent audit that's required by the A2 <laughs> amendment. Uh, I used to work for an organization that received a grant through uh, the Workforce Development Fund and uh, we actually lost money on administering those grants because of the reporting requirements, but we did it because it was the right thing to do and we were a $10 million a year organization and we could absorb those costs of administering the grant, but uh, for a smaller organization like Helmets to Hard Hats, uh, it becomes more difficult for them to absorb it. So this extra money would help cover some of those reporting obligations and still make sure uh, they're able to fully uh, serve the, the vets that they're intending to. Good. Thank you, Representative Norris. Um, are there any questions? Good. The A3 amendment is before us. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Good. Hearing none. Uh, Representative Norris, if you'd go to the bill itself, please. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee, I'm proud to uh, bring forward the bipartisan Helmets to Hard Hats bill. I consider myself a, a thrifty guy, so I love a buy one, get one deal when I find one at the <laughs> store. And I consider this the legislative equivalent of a buy one, get one. We're helping our members of the military and our vets transition into civilian life, while at the same time addressing the shortage of Minnesotans going into the construction trades. This bill would provide $227,500 each of the next two years for the Helmets to Hard Hats program that helps get our veterans into registered apprenticeships. The funding goes to a number of activities. It goes to help recruit, retain, assist, and support National Guard, Reserve, and active duty military members and veterans and their participation in registered apprenticeship programs. And then it also helps to connect them with career training and employment in the building and construction industry. It's important to note that this program is open to all registered apprenticeship programs, union or otherwise. And we've got some excellent witnesses who can share more statistics about the program and tell their personal stories about its impact. But uh, first, I want to extend my gratitude to our uh, impressive list of bipartisan colleagues uh, who have signed on to co-author this bill. Uh, Representative Weens, who's a decorated veteran himself, uh, our esteemed chair, who's also a veteran, uh, and then Representative Bennett, uh, who has been a longtime supporter of this program. So I appreciate the bipartisan support. Uh, and with that, uh, Mr. Chair, I'll turn it over to our testifier. Good. If the testifiers would please come down. We might pull up another chair there and on the side. Or two. <laughs> Good. And uh, welcome to the committee. I appreciate it if each of you would uh, identify yourself and then uh, proceed with your testimony, please. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Axel Shaw, uh, former Marine Corps Reserves. Currently, I am a millwright with Local 548. Uh, through some fellow uh, service members, I was referred to Helmets to Hard Hats. Um, got on there, got an email list, um, ended up uh, talking to the millwrights and they've taken me in and I think it's a fantastic program. I know probably two or three dozen guys who have uh, found long-term careers through the program, uh, both getting out of the military and while they're in the reserve side. Good, thank you, thank you for the testimony. And uh, if you would testify please and give us your name. Hi, uh, my name is Mariah Mudek. Um, I'm a part of the local 322. Um, I was uh, I was out of a job, and um, my sergeant pointed me to the Helmets to Hard Hats website. I put my my email into like the thing, and uh, Sam Heimlich actually contacted me, and he brought me down to the union. 
and he told me about the apprenticeship program that they had going on at that at the local. Um, he explained to me the process of applying and um, the schooling that came along with it, the one week every four months. And uh, I can say that it genuinely helped um, with decision making for what to do with the rest of my life for my career wise. Uh, I tried to tell anyone that any of my uh, companions in the military about this program because uh, it really helped with the transition from the military to the civilian life. It really provided a lot of stability and um, the question of what to do with the rest of my life was no longer a looming thought in my head anymore. So, uh, yeah, thank you. Good, well, thank you very much. And so if you'd like to testify, please give us your name. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee. My name is Justin Rost. I am the director of the Minnesota Helmets to Hard Hats program. I am also a Marine Corps veteran of infantry and a sheet metal worker here in the Twin Cities metro area. Um, I uh, first came across the Helmets to Hard Hats program when this program got started in Minnesota. I was not a byproduct of getting into uh, a trade because of it, but I do share a lot of the same, um, a lot of the same backstory as many of our veterans that come in. When I got out of service, I already had a family. Um, I had bills to pay, I had uh, children to take care of, and when I got back, it was a big question mark on what I'd be able to do with my skills as an infantry Marine. Um, I did not see that the civilian side saw the value in the leadership qualities, the attention to detail, and other things that we learn in service. Uh, so that brought a lot of weight to what was I going to do with the rest of my life, and how was I going to provide for my family. Uh, when I found my way into a registered apprenticeship program, um, it gave me a very structured environment in which felt really good for a veteran to be in. We were used to structure, we were used to knowing what our path looked like for the most part. Um, and that's what I got out of registered apprenticeship. I was able to go in, I knew how many years I had to be in apprenticeship. I knew what my pay was going to be as I proceeded through my apprenticeship. It provided a structured, healthy environment for me to raise my children a financially stable environment for me to support my family and be able to afford things for them that I wanted to give them. Um, on top of that, it really helped alleviate any mental stress that you may come into when you're coming home from service. Um, as we all know, PTSD, traumatic brain injury, things like that have been ramping up the amount of suicide we're seeing in the veteran community. That's obviously something we wanna help um, try and alleviate. And the financial support we can help uh, or the financial support that we can provide by helping them get into a registered apprenticeship and into a construction career does help alleviate that. On top of that, um, as the director of the Helmets Hard Hats program, I did participate in the, uh, the VA and community-based um, Twin City Suicide Prevention Coalition for military veterans. Uh, that reshaped the way that the VA plans to do outreach throughout the country. Um, so we're taking steps wherever we can to try and help with mental health on top of trying to help with uh, employment in the construction trades. Excellent. Are there any uh, questions of the testifiers? Yes, uh, Representative Olson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and I think this is to uh, the executive director here. So uh, I'm wondering, uh, we got this flyer here. It says you had 137 veterans served last year and then 40 placements. I'm just curious what the difference is between serving a veteran and actually getting them a, uh, a placement in a construction career. And then also uh, some discussions on, uh, we're talking about taxpayer dollars. We're talking about state funding here for this, this program, uh, an honorable and noble program. I'm a captain in the reserves currently, so you're not gonna find someone who's more supportive of soldiers uh, at this table currently. Um, but my question is, there are dozens and dozens of programs that help soldiers transition from the active duty to the civilian side, dozens of programs that'll help me find a job if I need one. Why should you get that money instead of someone, some other organization? Because there are a lot of them out there. Sure. Mr. Roost. Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee, representative, um, 
what I can tell you about the 137 veterans served. So those are veterans who enter into the Helmets to Hard Hats program. They receive information geographically about apprenticeships in their area in the trades of interest that they are interested in. If somebody comes in and wants to be a plumber, they are going to receive information about being a plumber. We are not going to give them just whatever's open or whatever's going on. We're going to help them with what they want to do with their future. Uh, not to mention we're going to give them geographic information, right? So if you're in St. Cloud, you're going to get information for St. Cloud. If you uh, communicate that you also want to travel, we'll give you information from other places. But we're going to make it as personalized as we can for the area they live in to make it as comfortable for them to transition as possible. We're also going to give them uh, study materials so that if there is an entry test or some kind of comprehension test, they at least go in with a leg up on that information. And then we're going to also handle some wraparound services. If they have questions about their GI benefits or the ability to use them, we're able to answer some of those questions. If we can't, we will connect them with somebody who can. Uh, and the same could be said with mental health, the same could be said with just general health care or dealing with VA or who their county veteran service officer is. We can find that information out and make sure that they have it. So that's the initial part. The placements are the people who we call a known successful transition which have already been recorded by Mindali as being in a registered apprenticeship program. So it's not, hey, I got a job, thanks. It's they got a job, they got placed in the apprenticeship, and they are actively in the apprenticeship program. So that we're making sure that we're not getting any false information or uh, somebody who got a job but then didn't ever start the job or something like that. These are people who are well on their way to uh, a full-time career in construction and a lifetime career. Uh, as far as the uh, appropriation goes, we one of our biggest things is being uh, make sure we're connected to every one of the existing programs that we can be, right? Uh, one of the big things that I do is make sure that I'm working with DEED, I'm working with Career Force, I'm working with MACV. Uh, we've helped many, I actually have a couple of testimonials that didn't make it into the packet yet uh, that come from two employees of MACV. Um, they are now not there anymore, but they were last year. Uh, about the success rate that we had with them. It doesn't have numbers, but it does talk about the success that Helmets of Hard Hats has shared with them. Helmets of Hard Hats does partner with as many veteran organizations and communities as we can. So we work with VA Voc Rehab. We work with both Minneapolis and St. Paul Vocational Rehabilitation Centers for veterans. Uh, we work with MACV throughout the state. Uh, we work with uh, the Career Force Centers. Um, We've had a lot of uh, time where we spend going to meet with veterans that are coming to the veteran uh, employment days at the Career Force. And we also participate in all of the job fairs that we can that are veteran oriented. On top of that, we uh, work with the Beyond the Yellow Ribbon program um, in as many communities as we can and just try and make sure that if they have any needs, um, we're trying to make it so that if somebody says construction, they end up at my door. And that's why we feel the program is successful. We have helped over a thousand veterans. We were at a thousand twenty-five as of this morning when I sent information to a veteran uh, who lives in the northwest side of the state. Uh, that being said, with uh, over 185 placements into careers, we feel like we're making a positive change in uh, the outcome. That was a good answer. Good. Thank, Thank you. you. Are there any other questions? <laughs> good answer. <laughs> it's, that was a very comprehensive answer. Very good answer. I wish everyone gave answers. <laughs> uh, so if there are no further questions of either uh, Representative Norris or the testifier, I, I would like to represent agreement. No, no. Okay, I'd like to renew my motion at House File 284 as amended. Uh, be re-referred re to the House Labor and Industry Finance and Policy Committee. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Good. The bill is on its way. Thank you, Representative Norris. Thank, thank you, you Tess. Thank you. Thank you for coming down. General Mankey. This is probably the only time you'll see a sergeant major who delays a, a general. <laughs> uh, general Mankey, if you'd like to identify yourself for the record and uh, 
present your uh, your information. Mr. Chair, uh, committee members, thank you for seeing myself today. Uh, I'm Major General Sean Mankey, the Adjutant General of the Minnesota National Guard. And uh, with me today, I have uh, the Executive Director of the Department of Military Affairs, Mr. Don Kerr, is going to walk you through our budget request approved by the governor. Uh, so we'll get under that, and uh, we promise to be as succinct as we can and answer any questions. <laughs> thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Mr. Chair. <laughs> For the record, my name is Don Kerr. I'm the Executive Director of the Department of Military Affairs, and we're going to work with some alacrity to get through a budget briefing for you today. There's going to be three portions of it, Mr. Chair. I'm going to spend the first six slides, about five minutes, talking about our agency budget in the general fund and what we do with the money that is appropriated by the legislature. And then uh, I'm going to shift into our request for adjustment to that moving forward, and that will be the, the majority of what I'm going to be briefing you on and then at the very end I'll give you a very super short overview of our capital investment initiatives uh, that we're going to be briefing in capital investment tomorrow and next week depending on on chamber um, Good. With that I will move out so uh, mr. chair first one is a, a little slide and there's a couple of things on here I want to point out to you so the twenty six million seven hundred eighty nine thousand dollar number is the base for 2013 spending and then you'll see there are a couple of reductions to that in 24 and 25. The first one is a one-time appropriation that went to the Navy League out of the 23 budget. And so that's being reduced from the base in both 23 and 24. And then you'll notice a million dollar reduction uh, from a current law base change. That has to do with an increase that we received to the enlistment incentives appropriation for 23 only. That was a $2 million increase with the instructions of reducing that amount to a million a year in the base. And so what looks like a million dollar reduction is a million dollar reduction. And that will be relevant when I talk about a request that we have to further increase the enlistment incentives appropriation later. Okay. But that just kind of gets you through the numbers. So, and then you'll see the, uh, the amount that we're requesting in each of the fiscal years for the five, not 13. I can't count to 13, I only got 10 fingers. So. Uh, Commissioner Herkey is ahead of me on that one. The five uh, recommendations that we're making in our budget. Um, and moving on. So in the general support account, uh, which we have received about $3.6 million in state fiscal year 23. Um, I'll get you some detail about what we do with that, but that, that's a small part of our budget. That basically funds the day-to-day -day operations of the agency. The maintenance of military training facilities, about $9.8 million a year in our budget. That's what we use to maintain the property that the Department of Military Affairs has and the buildings and the equipment. And most of that is there to match with federal dollars. So most of our facilities are predominantly maintained by the federal government, but we have to have some state funds available because some of the maintenance activities require a state share on the Fed for the federal side. There are, are also some payroll dollars in there for folks in our agency that support that activity. Enlistment incentives is the largest portion of our budget. We use that to pay for state tuition reimbursement and also for reenlistment bonuses, extension bonuses, and uh, we have something called a, a MOS transition bonus that uh, we try to fill some of our key shortage MOSs that are difficult to fill by throwing some money at those problems to, to enhance the readiness of the Minnesota National Guard. And then the last category in the general fund is the emergency services appropriation. Generally, the emergency services appropriation is what gets used when the governor calls out the National Guard. It is an open appropriation. There's a statutory process where we provide an estimate to the Commissioner of Management and Budget and he notifies the chairs of Ways and Means and the Finance Committee in the Senate that those expenditures are going to occur and then they're automatically appropriated by law. So they don't require any legislative action other than the notification. Generally speaking, that amount has been calculated for budgetary reasons by MMB using a formula that takes the eight, last eight years of actual expenditures, throws out the high and the low, and then averages those to come up with a number. 
That system worked really well until about three years ago when we went from less than $200,000 a year on average to just over $20 million in two years. So, um, but, you, but yet somehow it all worked out in the end. So the effect that should have happened there is the state's budget should have taken quite a, well, a substantial hit, but because of the uh, surpluses that we've been running, it really wasn't noticed very much. So there is about $2 million that will show up in the spreadsheet later. And generally that has been strictly based on that calculation, but you will note one of the requests that we're making this year is actually going to be attributed against that emergency services appropriation. So that means moving forward, we will likely see a carry forward, not a carry forward, but a recurring amount in emergency services in addition to the uh, calculation. So that probably only made sense to Ms. Roberts, but uh, trust me, we'll, we'll, we'll explain it again later um, and it will probably not make any more sense then, but we'll, we'll still go at it. So now I'm gonna give you some detail on what we do with the general support appropriation. Again, in FY23, that's about $3.6 million. That pays for most of our full-time equivalents and I want to note for you that we have 17 full-time members of the National Guard that are paid by the state. They're mostly civilians. The Adjutant General is one, I'm one, Lieutenant Colonel Athman is one. So you've got three of the 17 that work at AGO in the building today. We have one more full-time at the Army Aviation Support Facility. He's our statewide safety guy. And then we have three at Camp Ripley. In addition to those 21, we have about 460 more state employees who are paid for by the federal government. So the state pays them and we get reimbursement from the federal government to function as a service contractor to the feds. In addition to that, there are about 2,000 full-time members of the Army and Air National Guard who are paid as either active guard and reserve or full-time technicians completely straight from the federal government, no money passing through the state at all. So from a cost share perspective, the money that the legislature provides to pay the payroll of the Minnesota National Guard, though I personally am very appreciative of it because I, I wouldn't be getting paid otherwise, um, you're really getting a lot of supplementation from the federal government to provide the services that the National Guard provides in Minnesota and the opportunities uh, to many of our folks. Uh, we pay for payroll. Our deployment reintegration events, our facility security improvements, um, our veteran service building rent. Yes, we pay rent to the, uh, to the uh, Department of Administration for our offices in the veteran service building. And then we have an annual military fund distribution that goes out to military units. It's been in place since the 30s uh, that provides a small amount of money by unit to allow them to buy office supplies and other things that aren't covered by the feds in their local locations. And then, of course, uh, we have some phone services and that sort of thing. Moving on to the maintenance appropriation. Again, we have expenses for the payroll team that does all of our purchasing and contracting, all of the folks that, that work with the program managers when we're doing major construction projects, and we do a lot of those, um, our utilities, our janitorial services. We have airport joint use agreements that allow the, the 133rd airlift wing to do landings at Rochester and, and other places and actually pay <coughs> some of the fees uh, to Minneapolis, St. Paul. And then that's where we, uh, we do our repairs and building improvements from. And that thing on the bottom is called the MSABC bond payments. That's another one of those mysteries that hopefully someday we'll come and talk to you about. The, the Minnesota State Armory Building Commission is a statutory corporation <coughs> that is chaired by the adjutant general and there's $15 million in bonding authority. And their authority is, is to specifically build armories. And so, that was put into place when we had great difficulty getting the legislative timelines in the state and federal government to align to be able to build new armories when there's both a state and federal share. And that gave the agency some autonomy in being able to run the timeline so that we weren't dependent on a bonding bill passing to make a deal with the federal government to go build an armory here and there. Um, a few years ago, $15 million was a lot of money. No, it's not that much money, but we do use the Minnesota State Armory Building Commission to be able to move some projects forward without having to seek direct um, authority from the legislature for the bond proceeds or for the money that we need. And then we actually pay the carrying costs for those bonds from the maintenance appropriation of the Minnesota National Guard. That's another one of those confusing ones that's always been around out there. But we do think that because of the, the increasing costs that we're seeing, this is kind of a teaser. At some point in the future, we probably are gonna have to come in and ask for authority to go beyond the 15 million uh, because that just doesn't buy you as much armor as it used to. 
Uh, moving on to the incentives appropriation, and again, this is where most of our money goes. The good news is we've only got three full-time employees that manage this entire program, and they're dispersing the rest of this go directly to service members, reimbursing them for student loan repayment, or, or excuse me, for student tuition reimbursement program, and also the enlistment bonuses that we've added and the reclassification bonus that I mentioned earlier. Um, this is a great program. It gives us our competitive edge in the recruiting market <coughs> here in Minnesota. We think it adds value to the community in a number of ways because it literally encourages our service members to become better citizens by becoming educated and, and further contributing to society. Uh, so we think it's a very important program and again, the largest program that we manage. The emergency services appropriation, because we're short on time, I already talked about that a little bit, but basically this is where we pay service members come, that come on state active duty pay the bills, pay the rental fees for the vehicles that we borrow, those types of things. So, moving on to the initiatives. Yep, checking my time, it should be okay. We have five initiatives. Three of those are in the general support component of our appropriation. Uh, one of those is in the enlistment incentives appropriation and the last one will wind up in the, the domestic operations, the emergency services uh, uh, portion of the budget. I'll talk about those in the order they're listed. So the first is a Minnesota Cyber Coordination Cell. We have identified that obviously cyber is an emerging realm in the military industrial complex and in our civil society as well. And that creates a lot of conflicts is trying to figure out how to bridge that gap between what we do in the military and what happens to our civilian infrastructure. And it's really been a difficult struggle for the Department of Defense to come to terms with this because for an awfully long time, America fought its wars not here, on the other side of ocean someplace. And so it was very easy to distinguish the difference between what was a defense initiative and what was a law enforcement initiative. And of course in the cyber realm, a lot of those borders just kind of go away. And so a lot of things that the military used to be able to not talk about to any of the civilians because it wasn't relevant, are suddenly very, very relevant. And finding ways to bridge the information gap that exists between the Department of Defense and even state government entities uh, is an emerging field that is fraught with difficulty, particularly uh, on the legal side, trying to determine what can and cannot be shared. Um, adding the cyber coordination cell will give us a team of dedicated individuals who can work closely with MINUT and with the Department of Defense, the Department of the Air Force, the Department of the Army and Space uh, Command now, to try to make sure that, that the security blanket that we receive is more comprehensive and there's better communication between the civilian and military entities that are involved in those operations. Uh, our proposal is to bring on a three person team. These would all be soldiers in this case um, for a couple of reasons, but uh, that's our intent and we would try to carry these into the future as something of an initiative. There are about 17 states that have done something similar to this None of them in exactly the fashion that we're proposing, but nonetheless very close to that. Um, so there's a, I'll, I'm not, I'm gonna pass by this, but it's in your packets if you could review it. The problem statement of why we think we need to go there and the recommended manning. And I'll move on to the next initiative, which is a holistic health and fitness program. Holistic health and fitness is an army program that tries to expand beyond just making sure that our soldiers are physically fit, but also being concerned about their mental fitness, their spiritual fitness, uh, and their emotional fitness and, and going to a different level of medical readiness than we've had before. And we think it's a very important thing to invest in. The Army thinks it's a very important thing to invest in. Unfortunately, the Army doesn't think it's important enough to invest in any of it in the reserve component. And so we think it's very important that we use the resources that we have available to try to go leg up on this process and put a team in place so that we can at least start covering the rudimentary portions of this. So there's a holistic health and fitness page in there. And this really super busy slide that I'm not gonna brief in any detail, but I wanted to give you an idea. Each one of those boxes generally indicates a person that the Army thinks is important to support a brigade. And a brigade is about 5,000 soldiers. We have about four of them here in Minnesota, though the numbers aren't quite that high. Um, there's a lot of people on this slide they're funding zero for the reserve component units. Uh, we think that selecting these five will at least give us a leg up on this program. And what we're really concerned about is trying to figure out how we can better retain service members that we already have a large investment in, so that if we can fix their knee, 
rather than have them try to figure it out on their own, maybe they can continue to serve a while longer. So a physical therapist is one of the teams here and making referrals to other health care, spiritual care, psychological care resources so that we can keep more of our service members in uniform and uh, get the investment back that we've already made in them. Uh, the maintain current service levels proposal, uh, again, this is a calculation that we made with MMB that we think the uh, impact is. You'll notice that ours is significantly smaller than the Department of Veterans Affairs, but that's because we only got to pay for 40 people here and they have to pay for hundreds. So um, that, that's why that number is so much smaller than the, the other agency. And I'm going to move real quickly. Um, yeah, this one gets kind of weird because Roberts will be able to follow along with me. That looks like it's a $3 million ad. It is, but it's actually only a half a million dollar a year more than we received in FY23. Mm. So again, because we increased by 2023, but then decreased, they're supposed to decrease by 1,024, we're asking for a million five, I'm sorry, a million. We're asking for a million five, so it's a net increase over FY23 of 500,000 for this year and next year. So it's a, an increase, not as substantial, in, well, it's just 500,000 bucks <coughs> substantial, but it's not as big as it looks. Uh, we think it's very important though to continue to, to invest in uh, the things that keep our service members in service. And then the last one is the one that's gonna wind up in that emergency uh, category. So for the last 30 years or so, we've been investing in items that are not required by our federal mission, but are required by our state mission. And very specifically, 800 megahertz radios. We got a bunch of 20 year old 800 megahertz radios that are now obsolete. And we have to start replacing those. <coughs> and so we think that adding this budget line is a way for us to acknowledge that we are gonna have certain investments that we have to make before we're needed to have them. And this is our first step at doing that. You'll notice there's a, a little bit of a bigger one the first year than the second, but we're looking at a long-term plan to try to put some sustainment money <coughs> to make sure that our service members are capable and prepared to be able to provide the kind of civic response uh, support to the state of Minnesota that they've become accustomed to receiving. So again, that's the uh, operating budget overall, moving very quickly to our capital bonding request. These are really carry forwards from last year with some inflation. Uh, we found an amazing increase in the cost of construction. And we went through and looked at the different projects that we had requested last year that had made it into the bonding bill that didn't pass. We did a slight adjustment for inflation that brings us up to an additional 6.7 million to support programs that had already been approved in a previous bonding bill in 2020 that we can't afford anymore. I would also note that we've already thrown about $2 million of our operational funding to keep these projects moving. So this still doesn't really capture the entire expanded cost of that. And the last one is a part of a plan phase for 24.7 million to complete the Rosemont renovation, total 31 million, 487,000. Uh, and that's what we have from the directly from the department. There are a couple of other projects out there that uh, we are interested in that are not technically agency projects, one being the museum, or the military museum at Camp Ripley. Uh, we think that's a very important project, though it's not an agency project. And there's another initiative regarding building hangars in Duluth that are technically not agency products, projects, they were brought by others, but they have a direct impact on the agency and on the future, in that case, of the 148 fighter wing. So we're, uh, we're, we're supportive of both of those requests. Uh, I've seen the bill for the uh, museum. I've not yet seen bills for the uh, hangars, but we're expecting those to come uh, at some point. And uh, Mr. Chair, with that, I think we've just about used our time. You're, you're amazing, Mr. Chair. <laughs> <laughs> I should say you continue to be amazing. Um, Good, and again, I think, you know, there'll be questions that'll come up as the bills are, are brought forward and we get a chance to look into them in detail. And uh, General Mankey, thank you. Uh, Mr. Kerr, thank you. Uh, it's a great presentation and, and very, very short. <laughs> Mr. Kerr, happy to that. come back at any time. <laughs> <laughs> Good, I think we're all set. Uh, with that, uh, the meeting is adjourned. <laughs>